Hello, and welcome to the DCL Learning Series. Today's webinar is titled Technology and the Life Sciences, Tool Selection, Systems Implementation, Data Migration, and Security. My name is Marianne Kalahana. I'm the VP of Marketing at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we begin, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available in the on-demand section of our website at dataconversionlaboratory.com. Please feel free to submit questions at any time. Uh, we're gonna try to save some time at the end to answer those questions. And, um, you know, I just wanna say that technology plays a very critical role in the life sciences accuracy, traceability, compliance, along with speed to market is critical. Improving content and data management, IT systems, compliance and program management, streamlines research and the drug development life cycle. So Data Conversion Laboratory, Court Square Group and JANA Life Sciences, um, we all came together to develop this learning series and address how technology can contribute to your success. This is the sixth of seven webinars in our series. You can see the other topics lift, listed here on this page. Um, all, of, all of this information is on one area of our website and we're gonna push that URL out to you right now if you wanna catch up on others or register for the, our final um, webinar in this series. So I am thrilled to have today's panelists here today. We have David Turner, consultant and head of partnerships at Data Conversion Laboratory. Keith Parent, uh, CEO of Court Square Group. And Ron Nylon, president of JANA Life Sciences. Welcome so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Before we begin, I just want to give a real quick overview um, to Data Conversion Laboratory, or DCL, as we're also known. Um, we've been in business for 40 years, and we like to say our mission is to structure the world's content. DCL services and solutions are all about converting, structuring, and enriching content and data. We are one of the leading providers of XML conversion services, and an industry expert with SPL conversion um, for some of the world's leading global pharma companies. So if you have complex data or content challenges, we can help. So now, Keith, um, can you tell us a little bit about Court Square Group? Keith, are you there? Yeah, you're on mute, sir, I think. Yeah, there Sorry, we go. Sorry, God. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was talking, but uh, you didn't. You saw me moving there. Um, we are a, an audit-ready compliant cloud provider. We have a cloud environment that has our um, in, environment that can host multiple applications within that environment. Um, anything that from a life sciences perspective, all the way from preclinical, all the way through clinical into manufacturing. We do a lot of work in clinical trials, particularly around document management systems and um, systems for holding electronic content uh, specifically for um, regulatory submissions. So if anything like that is, is uh, what's needed, we can do all of that. We also have what we call RegDoc 365, which is a qualified and validated um, content management solution specifically for um, clinical trials and for submissions. Okay, on to the next. Ron? Thanks, Keith. And thank you very much, uh, Marianne, for enabling us at Jana Life Sciences to take part in this webinar series. We re really appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, as a company, we're 48 years old. We're third generation family owned. Uh, we basically do technical services that run this spectrum from uh, technical documentation uh, to the aspects of quality and compliance and operational excellence that sort of are the umbrella that over overarch much of what what we do. Uh, we do project and program management and we do IT systems as well. We work with a variety of uh, standards and formats including XML and DITA. 
uh, we have project managers at the heart of each and every project that we do. We're ISO 9001 2015 compliant, and we're currently undergoing certification for ISO 13485, which applies to medical devices. Uh, so I appreciate the uh, chance to give you an overview, and thank you again, Marion. All right, well, let me pick it up from here and just uh, kind of say again, thank you everybody for coming. Um, you know, one of the things that we were uh, gonna be talking about today is, uh, you know, we talked about, uh, we're gonna talk about the tool selections, we're gonna talk about um, systems implementation, we're gonna talk about data migration, all these pieces. But I wanted to kind of get into it at first by just making sure you kind of understand the perspectives of, of those of us who are on, on this call. Um, so, so Ron has been in uh, pharma for, years and years and years and actually Ron really only recently to the um, uh, to the vendor side right you actually served uh, you actually uh, in the life sciences as a, as a on the client side for, for most of your career is that right that's that's correct yes I've had the, the good fortune to work with a variety of companies uh, all at the headquarters level with Pfizer in, in New York Amgen uh, Thousand Oaks Genentech and South San Francisco and Gilead Sciences, uh, among some of the companies I've worked with. Excellent. And then, and then you look over here at Keith, and uh, you know Keith has uh, you know this environment where he has seen so many different pieces of technology uh, in the in the pharma realm for so many years, um, probably more years than you're you're wanting to admit, right, Keith? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been in business for 26 years, and um, you know we started with Pfizer as the first client, you know, 26 years ago, and just over time, it's it's morphed into all sorts of different things that we've done, from you know high performance computing to electronic lab notebooks to uh, hosting SAP HANA in the manufacturing space. So I've seen a lot of the integration aspects of pulling these things together. So the topic for today of all these things with with pulling the systems together is really relevant kind of to the whole career of, of, of what we've been doing with our client base. So I'm really glad that we got to this one and it fits really well into the overall learning series that we put together here. Yeah. And I personally came to the, uh, come to the table with um, really from the content side, right? So I've been working with structured content now for more years than I'd like to count um, as well. And, um, you know, specifically in the realms of component content management, uh, and then also with SPL content and uh, pharma content. And I'll also say this as we go into, yes, while this uh, this webinar today is primarily geared towards uh, a life sciences audience, um, I think a lot of the things that we're going to talk about are also pretty relevant uh, to other markets as well. And uh, so we're, we're not afraid to answer any questions about some other markets as well if uh, if those come up. But the way I thought we'd lead into it is, um, you know, let's just start, before we start talking about, you know, here's the best practice for this, here's the best practice for that. Let's start by just talking about these, uh, these trends. Uh, so I see a handful of trends here on, on this slide. Um, Ron, why don't you kind of pick it up from here and talk us through some of these trends and some of the things that you've seen. Sure, you know, precision medicine is increasingly becoming the norm. If I go back in my career like Keith, I've been in uh, the industry longer than maybe I'd like to admit. Uh, definitely it's been 30 years and having worked in global drug development uh, with companies, but especially in my years at, at Genentech where you, the aspect of a targeted medicine was increasingly the approach taken with biologics. Now you know, with genomics, as just yet another example of technology and it's under, the understanding of biology coming up into play. Increasingly, that aspect of precision medicine is going even further to just totally personalized medicine. And cellular therapy is, uh, is probably one of the prime examples here. <clears throat> um, so th that's happening on the scientific understanding side, but then what's happening from a regulatory and pharmacoeconomic standpoint, as well as actually it's driving this imperative. As we get more global data coming in, those analytics are serving to help uh, the regulatory bodies around the world to understand the value mm -hmm. propositions of medicines. So precision medicine is definitely a, a key component of 
how companies are approaching their drug development and toward this end, the idea of a, an adaptive trial is really critical to help them to understand that particular uh, subset of patients and their, their ability to respond um, and in a safe manner to, to product. Mm. You know, it's interesting, Ron, because um, you were talking about the precision medicine. I've seen more now with our client base doing stuff with stem cells, and I'm actually working with a number of uh, companies now that are looking to put, you know, cell processing facilities out there and the whole concept of chain of custody and, and being able to track a patient's cells all the way from pulling them in, um, you know, expanding upon the, the number of cells that they have and then doing something with those cells and then sending them back to the patient is really big. Um, and this last year, with all the COVID stuff and the adaptive trials, you know, we've got customers that are, are looking to how do they change the trial midstream because now patients can't get into the, the clinic and do different things and they're incorporating Zoom or they're in incorporating other technologies to help out to, to, to drive some of that. So it's really important to see, you know, what are the tools that we select and, and, and how are we working with these customers to try to put some of these, these things out there. Yeah, I'm yeah. just... A, and I think... I'm sorry, Dave. I was going to say, and I think that it's also, you know, from a content perspective, I see things like uh, precision medicine, and I think that, um, you know, you, you, you've got a couple of problems going on here that are making you need to invest, right? You've got the increasing amount of data, more and more bigger, big data problems. And then you've also got the whole kind of paradox that, you know, the more you personalize content, actually, the more you need to kind of standardize and, and make your content modular, so that you can you can start applying you know content pieces uh, to that, um, and then even looking down a little further, I think about the content and technology amongst all of this. Uh, you're having to make investments there uh, to do this personalization, but then there's also the big piece of of regulatory. We've got more and more regulatory requirements with you know things like Health Canada coming on board, uh, you know increasing spore requirements or IDMP in Europe and uh, on and on. So anyway, so Ron, what were you going to say? Yeah, so just maybe going back to the aspect of cellular therapy and what we're seeing there is this uh, chain, if you will, of steps of extracting cells from a patient, bringing them into a facility, manufacturing them, bringing them back. And as, as I think Keith described it, sort of it's needle to needle. Um, and th that aspect is sort of a white glove service that's being provided by the the healthcare community, uh, it's biologic companies, uh, biotech companies together with those that are providing the healthcare. Uh, it could be maybe a, an academic institution that is really on the cutting edge of cellular therapy. But the point I think you, that we need to think about is this chain of, of steps really need to be so well managed, but in especially in terms of the validation of what's happening mm -hmm. from one step to the next to have total assurance that, you know, as it goes full circle and back to the patient that, you know, everything has been in fact done to the, the rigor of uh, the regulatory requirements and the academic institutions, ethics boards and what have you. But, you know, to your point, David, too, with the modularization of the, the information, right, because these are very, um, customized, if you will, trials that are happening with patients, <clears throat> in some ways, it's it's like a micronization of a protocol that has to happen and all of those steps and trying to do it without modular, doing a, a modularization of the content is then going to make it really prohibitively difficult. So I think it's just really important for companies to think about that if, if they're in that domain. Yeah. And for sure they are. Yeah. Well, I think there's John. Marion, I'm, uh, Marian, I'm uh, going to ask that you go ahead and go to our next slide here, so we can kind of kind of continue this on and and talk about these trends there. And Keith, you can pick up right there and then lead us into this slide too. Sure. Um, one thing I was going to talk about was just the fact that um, you know AI is one of the big topics here on, on in the industry and what's going on and across the board. I'm actually on a, a RIM working group right now. RIM stands for Regulatory Information Management trying to look at different systems in the regulatory world. And one of the things that, um, as we're putting out new specs, people were talking and said, we can't make it so FDA-centric uh, because we think here in the U.S. about the FDA, 
but realistically, to, to hit on your point before, David, there's so many things going, going on across the world. Well, one of the other things that we're doing in the RIM working group is also the AI. How does AI affect regulatory? Because mm-hmm. right now, you don't really think about it as much there. Um, you think about it more with the big data and the analytics early on when they're trying to do high-performance computing early on, looking at um, maybe a large images or things like that, and you're pulling those things together. Um, but they all feed in, and what's happening is there's just so much more data happening. And with the Internet of Things, we all are wearing using wearables and doing more things as part of a clinical trial where mm. it's just generating more and more data to the point where people are even pulling in, you know, um, weather events and things like that, how they affect people's moods and things as part of a clinical trial. So there's lots of things across the board. And if you look at just in this with the innovation uh, in here, we're talking about real world data. How is that combined with with the data about patients? Um, Adaptive manufacturing, that's again, getting back to dealing with um, the cells and and things like that that we're gonna be doing. Um, Augmented reality, I'm working with some, um, a, a team out in Denver where they're actually taking the VR headsets and they're actually walking through the molecules, you know, putting those things on. So when you start to look at some of those kind of things that are happening, there really is a lot of innovation happening now, and and the data has to tra- traverse so many different systems that that's why we are a big pusher, and that's why early on in the learning series we talked about metadata and we talked about consistency of data because it's so important to be able to use it over multiple systems like that. Ron, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, and I, if I look at this spectrum of innovation and then if i layer it in my in my mind with the idea of blockchain <clears throat> all of this information is coming together and increasingly these pieces are being put together where there's a better understanding of what's happening with regards to not just the manufacturer of of products and those could be biopharmaceuticals or medical devices but then the ultimate utilization and the ultimate benefit mm-hmm. for patients and so, you know, these are huge data sets that are being mined and they're being mined by different parties, but including, again, the regulatory parties to understand the, the true safety. You know, with the data that's out there on the Internet, if you will, right, uh, some of this is structured, but a lot of it is unstructured. Yeah. And the, the amount of change that's happening and being able to digest that unstructured data is so profound and the great thing is it, it's giving us much more transparency into the, the the viability of a product its safety its efficacy and ultimately too the the pharmacoeconomic aspects <clears throat> so but yeah each one of these on their own are very profound but and then when taken together uh, i think to your yeah. point it's the, we've seen a tsunami of data that's coming through and the question is how do you manage it all and I yeah. also think that Which different, I think- different components different components are actually being looked at as data, whereas we used to just think as the numbers that came out of the SAS data sets or the data management group would hand off and, and we'd be able to put tables together around a drug's efficacy or, or any of the number of things that we're putting tables together for. We're on that now also looking at the content themselves. So, so lots of documents are being used. And that's why AI can actually help process volumes of documents way better than just people can ever ever look at it that much. So that's where this innovation is really starting to take hold in the industry, particularly around things like regulatory and uh, and clinical processes. Yeah. So we've got a lot of data. We got a lot of uh, you know a lot of new things to look at here in terms of bringing this in. It's leading to a lot of new systems. Which go ahead, Marianne. I think you can go to the next next slide. And what we're trying to get across is that you know um, go ahead and click to the, the next one too as well. You know, there, there's just a ton of, of system types out there, and a lot of these are systems that maybe we didn't see so much in pharma uh, just a few years ago. I mean, just lots of different kinds of content, lots of different kinds of content management systems, lots of different systems that have to work across each other, which, uh, Mary, I'm going to go to the next one there, leads us to a crazy amount of complexity, and we start to have, you know, all these different options and all this different um, functionality, and you begin to wonder, what exactly do we need? What is it we've got to have? Because meanwhile, we're trying to produce drugs, not just by IT systems here. Uh, so anyway, let's move on to the next slide, and let's get in and let's talk about some of the things that that come into play. Um, you know, some of the factors that come into play, uh, some of the questions to consider, and um, 
and I'll leave it open. Well, here, um, we'll start with Ron again this time. Sure. <clears throat> so I, th I think when we look at systems today, they're increasingly large and increasingly complex. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. You, kn you know it, and you see it through things like Microsoft, <laughs> which started at, at very specific applications like Word or Excel. And now today you have Office 365, which literally has dozens of applications that are running together to some degree in a woven manner where you can then get analytics on the back end business engine. But um, the, the fact is that each one of these major systems or platforms is then competing, if you will, to some degree or another with the next. For instance, if we look at the aspects of enterprise content management, you know, this is an aspect that you know increasingly companies are thinking about and trying to sort of tackle, if you will, but they've got all these different data repositories. And then the question is like, how do you get above that? And how do you sort of create a taxonomy for your organization? How do you create an understanding of the metadata so then you can bring this data together and manage it more at an enterprise level? as opposed to down at that individual document level. And so it's sort of like continents shifting, if you will, or plates shifting on the globe. And then you, when you think of the data, it's like the water. You know, you've got this ocean of data, but you want to create these unique data streams or data lakes, and then really to, to distill it so that you can uh, analyze it and develop insights to that information to help you to understand how to go forward. So there, there's an aspect of then bringing these together. And uh, in some ways you need to migrate data and, and huge volumes of it. In other ways, you need to sort of homogenize your data and then seek to integrate it. And you know that's a huge task in and of itself that does require you to operate at a much higher level within the organization. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that many companies will have is, is they're trying to sort of shift, if you will, and it's a paradigm shift from individual document management to that aspect of enterprise management. Yeah. And, Ron, to, to, to and even on to some of that, to tag on to some of that, Ron, one of the things I was thinking about is just looking at even this one slide in front of us. When you start to think about multiple systems and how they interact together, you know, part of the tool design that you want to look at is, is um, how are my tools going to fit together? When I look at a, a, a roadmap of the different systems we need to put in place, we know that we need certain systems at certain times when we're, we're um, developing our, our environment. However, we want to make sure that they interact together as well. And part of that is just even on this, this one screen, when you talk about content management, that content management could feed into a RIM system, which then also can tie in directly with the labeling and the artwork management because you're going to make sure that whatever's showing up on the labels for the patients um, tie back to the data that's in the content management and in whatever got submitted to the, to the regulatory authorities. So all of these things kind of work hand in hand. So when you're dealing with any of these systems, you've got to think about the other departments or the other areas within the company. That's where a kind of a, a, an overall strategy comes in and, and being able to work that out, I think, to that point. David, you were going to jump on something? Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to also add that, um, you know, the, you see content management in here, whereas we used to see the term uh, document management system. And even still, a lot of, I think, organizations are still thinking of their content just in terms of that full document format. But back to what we talked about even earlier, the whole concept of then, let's break that down into the modular components. Let's think about component content management. Let's start applying metadata at those levels so we can reuse those pieces so that we can make so much more uh, of what we've got. And not and again, not just to meet a regulatory requirement. Um, I think that's been the biggest difference in, in our business lately with some of these systems is, um, you know, companies used to look for a system where they could just store the SPL file that they submitted to the FDA. And so they didn't really care about, you know, XML or anything. They would hire a company like us to just create that at the end, submit it, you know, just for regulatory. But now companies, I think, are starting to think, okay, if I'm going to get a, a new enterprise content management system, you know, maybe I want to start managing this where I can manage those those components instead of everything just at the document level so that I can start, you know, maybe reusing content across a clinical trial or so maybe I can create my own 
uh, STL at the, at the click of a button by synthesizing it together into a document. Um, so I think that leads to a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the things that you're, you're trying to pick here. Um, what are some of the questions that, um, you know, if you guys sat down as a consultant, um, you know, with somebody in, uh, that was trying to pick a solution, what are some of the, what are some of the questions you might ask them? Or what are some of the things that you might tell them that they need to consider as they're, as they're picking the right tools? Well, I think some of the first questions would be whether you're looking to develop something that is on-premise, in the cloud, or a hybrid. You know, increasingly companies are looking to go the lightest uh, way, yeah. the cloud. Uh, but that that may or may not be the the optimal solution in, in some cases. Obviously, that's an easy question. There's there's this aspect though of internal versus external. When you look at this mm. sort of information that you need to manage, to what degree do you ma manage it internally or in collaboration with external parties? And that is something that's really critical to understand, um, as well as the, the companies they're partnering with, with regards to that data. And it may be a multitude of companies, and those companies today may be, let's say, a, a small set, uh, but maybe in a year or two, they anticipate it being a much larger set. And I think, you know, it's really critical to think about that because you you need to be architecting to where you have uh, mm. the ability to collaborate and integrate information across systems and across companies. And those companies that can do that better or best are going to have a significant competitive advantage. Yeah. And I think also, Ron, on that, on that point, I think that there are a lot of companies that will actually have their vendors um, providing the systems because they're using those systems. But then all mm -hmm. of a sudden, when a trial is over, they have to get that data back. They don't have a system to put it back into. So now they've got to think about what, where, how am I taking that data back, whether it's trial master file data or other, other data that they're going to be pulling back. So that's where you really have to talk to them and say, okay, what is your overall roadmap and how do we, where, where are we, what are we looking at? Who is providing? what service today and where do you want to be tomorrow and what happens with the next trial and the next trial after that so that those are some of the questions that we get into as to where is all the data coming from and how do we integrate that stuff together yeah and, and you touched on one aspect here too in terms of partners and maintaining data that's at a certain juncture but as we know in the industry sometimes you have a 10, 20, 25 year expectation for regulatory bodies to be able to go back and look at your data. And then the aspect of archiving that data and having it managed in a validated state is really important. Um, and by the way, uh, just going back to the, some of the basic questions, right? To what degree does this need to be validated? Who is going to do the validation? I've seen mm. several companies even more recently get caught in a pinch where they had a presumption that a major company was going to do uh, the validation of their system. But the fact of the matter is the onus rests with the individual companies increasingly to do these kinds of things. And that can create a, a little bit of a snag, if you will, in terms of being able to implement the system as quickly as one might like. Well, honestly, I think we could probably spend an entire webinar just on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we do need to also talk about some of these other things. So uh, once you've selected a tool and uh, you've decided you're going to be moving it forward, uh, what are some of the things that you need to think about in terms of systems implementation, systems integration, uh, change management, uh, example? Or actually, uh, yeah, and here for this particular example, if you're wanting to deliver modular content to the end user, um, you know, what, what is it you need to be thinking about? So I think the, uh, the number one thing is when you're implementing a solution, um, you've got to look at, first of all, how is it going to get end to end? So from the beginning all the way through the end, um, what are the tools that are going to be used by the end user or the, the series of users along the way? Um, if it's an adaptive trial, are they going to be using an ePro? Are they going to be using a tablet? Are they going to be using... Um, iPhones, handphone, you know, phones, um, smartphones. Um, where is the data going to be scored? If it is, to, to Ron's point, if it's a cloud-based or an on-premise-based solution, 
how is the data being captured um, when you're doing the implementation um, are you using the the proper um, dev test prod uh, construct to be able to put things out and promote from within to get to Ron's point earlier about validation typically you're going to put together um, the user requirement specs around it and you're going to make sure the system hits all of the the uh, requirements that you're identifying in a trace matrix to put together when you're when you're putting that system out there so the concept of an implementation makes sure that when the system gets implemented and you're running through your IQs, your OQs, and your PQs, you're going to want to make sure that that end user is seeing exactly what they should see um, based on the on the test plan that you put together. So to add on to the, uh, some of those thoughts that Keith was sharing there, I, I would say that <clears throat> with the complexity of the systems increasing and the multi functionality of if you will of these platforms there's this question of to what degree do you adopt the different component parts of that platform and perhaps it does make more sense to have a phased adoption over time mm -hmm. where you say you know this has six different component parts to it today maybe in a year it may have 12 and there we go flip to the next slide and maybe the the at the outset, you know, you might be just thinking to just ad adopt three or four of the six that are available, and then you know, in a year's time, maybe you're at the point of uh, you know a half dozen or or more. So a phased approach is is one thing that I would be advocating for, and another aspect is just the profoundness of change and change management and often this gets overlooked and I can tell you again with recent examples I've noticed that there's the tendency uh, to focus on the sh shiny object which is that software that tool and to get it implemented as quickly yeah. as possible but the most critical nature of element for one to think about is the aspect of one's ability to use that system and to have reinforcement of their knowledge so that they are adherent to the system and the process. And I think you know the process is the key word here, really trying to understand the business process and to ensure that from a user perspective that this system has been configured uh, to best meet or align with the processes that the company envisions the employees utilizing. Um, and often there's a, a bit of discordance here where people might say, well, that's the process, but this is the way we do it. And, you know, as you're adopting a new system, you know, it's a, it's a chance to sort of clean house, if you will, and get those things in order and to align the technical documentation with the way, in fact, the systems will be operating. And uh, yeah. so your standard operating procedures and your work instructions I think are something that are also overlooked with the implementation and change management. Yeah. Yeah, Mary Ann, if you could go to that next slide on ch on change management, I, I definitely want to hit on this in a little uh, little deeper perspective. You know, in, in my history, I, you know, I used to work in the in the technology field, and um, you know, it's funny when if you interview people after a, an engagement, usually uh, if something ever fails, they always tell you, "Oh, well, yeah, that that product just didn't work." Uh, or this whole and this, it was just a bad idea but you know from more of a consulting perspective when you step back and you really look at these things it seems to me most of the time when initiatives fail it's because of a change management issue it's because you know people were not um, you know were not brought on board in the right way they were given too much at, at one time or maybe they you know they didn't get the content right um, you guys have both dealt with, with change management a lot here um, what are some of the things that, that you've done with both content and technology uh, to help get users to stop pushing back and instead jump on board? Well, I think there's two different things you have to think about with change management, David. Um, one, of the, one of them is change management can be an IT or a technology-related question, and then change management is also a people-related question. So two things that happen in both of those regards. So on the people side of things, we always try to find um, who is going to be the champion or who's going to be that person who's going to be the the primary person within any one department that everybody else looks up to that, that works with 
we and we work with them so it's almost like a train the trainer type approach where that you know that those people are going to go to that person so you, you find that internal champion to work with and then on the technology side you know when, when we look at technology people hate change there is no doubt about it people hate change they have the, you know they, they understand what they were at so if, when you first go in there you look at you you kind of ask them how does it how, what do they do today what are their process today what are they going to and you try to figure out can I replicate something that they were using so it becomes familiar to them so it makes it easier to adopt something new or is it just kind of a you know sometimes you go into these places and people just say okay forget it stop using that one versus start using this and those are typically doomed to failure because people just rebel against some of those things so when I look at technology and I look at people I try to figure out what what were they doing how did they do it how can we take the newer system the new system and kind of mold some of what we're doing to help them kind of ease into the new system. So that's a, a tack that we'll take a lot when we're doing that. Ron, how about your experience in that? Yeah, I mean, you touched on some of the very elements, the aspect of really understanding whether you have stakeholder buy-in, whether you have the champions at the different levels in the organization to affect the change. If you're talking about something that's much more enterprise uh, level, then you, you need the, the stakeholders bought in at all levels. Uh, if it's just within a department, that's something different, right? But I think there's the aspect of understanding how much skin people have in the game. And this is where it's it's a very helpful exercise to go through and talk about the basics of, hey, what, what are we looking for in terms of those capabilities? And really to get the end users to weigh in on the user functionality. And then at the same time, to help them understand the benefits of the future state. Yes, enterprise content management is a heavy lift for an organization, but what are the benefits? Well, the, the benefits are people will be so much more efficient. They'll be able to develop documents with a modicum of effort. It's a 90 degree shift in terms of creating modular content, but you are able to move at Mach 3 with parallel publishing and uh, document production if you're embracing enterprise content management. So I like the idea of reverse engineering in some ways, uh, you know, just getting there with the users right at the outset and say, or ask them the question, what are you looking for? If it were the ideal system, what might that look like? And help them articulate that. And that helps them to sort of understand what they may be looking for in a platform yeah. or an application. And my, my two cents on this, you know, I, I look at this and I think the, um, you know, one of the biggest things I would focus on is is the champions piece that, that Keith mentioned a, a minute ago. And, uh, you know, I would say champions as opposed to a champion. Yes. Um, you know, way too often you get a single champion in a company and that person may get the, get the whole initiative pushed through. But then if they go to another organization a year from now, you might find your implementation in trouble. So you want to really focus on developing champions so that if somebody does leave the organization, you've got somebody to pick up the uh, pick up the, uh, the, the the mantle and run with it. And then the second part of that is a good consultant, a good outside consultant it can be worth their weight in gold. It's just um, having somebody who can, first of all, bring experience that from other companies that, that you might not be able to see. And that, and that perspective, that bigger picture uh, is enormous. Um, but secondly, a lot of times they can have hard conversations. They could point out things um, that maybe aren't politically correct for somebody internally to, to point out or bring up. And so sometimes they can ask the hard questions or they could push the hard things through uh, with their expertise. Um, so we all three know some good consultants in the industry. So if anybody has questions on that or wants to follow up, we can uh, certainly you know, talk to you about your project and help you know some good consultants like that. So. Anyway, again, we could probably spend an entire session just on this one, but uh, we need to talk about data migration now. So uh, let's uh, let's move on and let's talk about data migration. Um, you know, certainly as a as a piece here, uh, you've got um, actually just uh, go back. I want to talk about the uh, I just want to talk about data migration by itself first before we start talking about the personalization. Um, you know, we do a lot of work in terms of helping people migrate data. Uh, in terms of getting their content in the right format, you've got typically a lot of issues to think about in terms of, you know, how are you going to move this data? How are you going to get it to us? Is this going to be, you know, FTP? Is it going to be 
capacity as a hard drive? Is it going to be whatever? Um, there typically are some aspects involved with you need to digitize the data. Um, there's a whole aspect involved with trying to analyze the data for potential reuse. As we've talked about, you know, this idea of modular content, you know, breaking down what used to be just documents into their component parts and then trying to reuse those. Well, you need to figure out where is their potential for reuse. Um, and uh, so we, we have some tools that can help with that here at, at BCL. Um, and then, you know, also being able just to kind of understand, um, you know, where it's going uh, and what it's doing so that you can get an effective migration and make sure that you get the metadata right. Because sometimes the, the way the metadata is treated in one system, if you move to a similar system, even if you're moving, you know, the same kind of formats, the metadata might be housed differently in the new system. And so you've got to be thinking about that and map things uh, appropriately. Um, Ron, I'll go you first again here. Um, instead of, uh, well, before we get into the whole personalization thing we're going to talk about in just a second, just in general, what are some of the uh, best practices uh, you would recommend in terms of data migration? Yeah, so the first thing is to ask whether that data needs to be managed in a validated state. So I've seen some situations where people might port data from one system to another, let's say, system or area right, of uh, information management, and it gets compromised. It's not managed in the same validated fashion, if you will. Maybe they're not controlling the access of that data, just as an example. Uh, so I, the aspect of the chain of custody of that data needs to be just uh, really well understood and, and managed. I think there's another element too, is the aspect of redundancy of data. Uh, you know, when I work with companies and we're looking at documentation, often you, it's like going up into the attic. I call it the electronic attic. And you, you never know what you're gonna find there, but you find all this, a wealth of information, but a lot of it is redundant. I know DCL have tools uh, in terms of the harmonizer to be able to view documents and compare one vis-a-vis -vis another to see whether it in fact is redundant or to what degree it might be redundant. Um, so the redundancy is an element. And then there's the other dirty word called dirty data, like dirty documents, dirty data that may be, that needs to be better understood and then decisions need to be made as to how that gets managed within the pool, if you will, of, of data and whether maybe some data needs to be uh, extracted uh, because it's, it's, it uh, doesn't meet certain standards or needs. Yeah. yeah. Keith, you, you've obviously have, have seen a lot of systems and I, I dealt with a lot of migrations. What, what would be some of the things you would add here? There's a couple things that I would think about right away. One is, is it a one and done type migration um, or is it an ongoing migration? Am I working with a CRO that's going to be a, a multi-year study and every couple months we're going to be pull, pulling data in from that from that group? So those are kind of things that we think about. If it's a recurring process, do we treat it a little bit differently? To Ron's point, you have to make sure that everything that we do on a migration perspective is also validated. So your validation, you have to validate the migration process and make sure that um, you understand that it, it's going to migrate the data the right way. You're checking your, you're doing, you're looking at your checksums and all the different things you're going to do to make sure the data comes comes across correctly. Um, so I think those are a couple really key areas that are, you know, one of the technology trends we talked about was AI, and AI can help out a lot in data migration, particularly if you can use some AI techniques to be able to do natural language processing of content and um, maybe automated metadata tagging, things like that. That's where some of those things really help out a lot when you're moving data from one system to another. Another could be based on where the source data is coming from. Do I need tools to basically take um, what looks like a document because somebody, you know, sends me a document, but it's really an image file because somebody scanned it in on a scanner and they never OCR'd that. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I can't see if you didn't use optical character recognition on it. It's actually not even a searchable document. You can't find the data that's on that. There's tables on it that you can't read. Um, you can actually read it if you print it out and look at it, and if you look at it online, but when you go to search through things, you can't find it. So automatically OCRing of, of certain things and bring, bringing data in and classifying that data based on what the content is. Those are tools that I see that we're starting to use uh, a heck of a lot more within data migration, specifically to make the life easier and to clean up that data, as, as Ron was talking about. Take mm -hmm. that dirty data and make it cleaner for the system that you're putting it into. So 
those are huge, huge things you have to think about. And there's lots of systems out there and lots of migration. Sometimes we even automate the migration process um, by having automated tools. It, it may automatically, as soon as people put some things into certain folders, all of a sudden it gets automatically transfer, transferred from one place to another and put into the right place. Those are some of the things that we can do as well. So in my mind, I think that that's a, a great place for technology to be able to help out in, in, in that regard. If I could just add, David, uh, just one quick other point here or two. Uh, one is the aspect of uh, the data and its analysis. And if you are in fact migrating from perhaps one system or platform to another, uh, at what point do you make that switch for the, the organization to then go from the analysis in that one system or the other, or is there an overlap between the two? And I've seen that happen in some cases for sure. Uh, and the other element here is then just going back to the aspect of having archived data managed in a, a fashion that's uh, going to last through the years. If you are in fact migrating a, a large cube of data, let's say, uh, and it needs to be uh, accessible to regulatory bodies 10 or 20 years from now, there's a question of, do you have the key and the lock to get into that data? Um, so that's something that if you're thinking about it, you need to construct that box for the, that cube of data to go into so that mm. a, a data scientist will be able to open it up 10 or 20 years from now and be able to sort of analyze it, if you will. Yeah. Um, Marianne, I want to make sure we get to the topic of, of blockchain today. Uh, so let's skip through this uh, part here on, on this slide. Um, I do want to just emphasize that we, we do have data from a multitude of sources, and that is certainly uh, something that you've got to be thinking about uh, when, it, when it comes in. Uh, but let's move in and let's, let's talk a little bit about the quality and security uh, piece of this. Uh, because I think we're seeing with all of this that, you know, that <clears throat> the idea of, of quality and security is going up and up and up and up. Um, things aren't getting any easier. <sighs> things are happening more and more worldwide. So, uh, Keith, we'll let you go first this time. What, what are the big things that you think we need to think about in terms of, of quality and security when we're getting a new system? Well, at this point, I think there's, there's a couple things that we have to think about, particularly we talked a little bit earlier about regenerative medicine and needle to needle processing. If I'm going to be taking a person's cells out of their body, doing something for those cells and putting them back into their body, they're going to want to make sure that that, that that's their cells going into their own body. Right. So the concept of blockchain, which was really which was really something that, that kind of grew out of the financial world to, to track monetary um, you know, transactions now can be used and is being used on a, on a much more wide basis to track those kind of things within, um, within our industry. And I think that that usage is gonna continue to grow and continue to drive. And there's a security around the fact that you know that that data is, has a chain of custody all the way through and that's what that blockchain is gonna to help to provide uh, for that. Um, and from a security perspective around data being compromised and things like that, you know, we within our audit ready compliant cloud environment have to make sure that security is like one of those main tenants of everything that we do, because the last thing you want is anybody to have access in or be able to get to these things. And now that we've got much more, um, many more companies working together with external partners or other vendors that they're working with, the security aspects of being able to do that with single sign on and all the different things that we deal with is just, you know, right to the right to the, the paramount process of, of being able to work with these multiple companies. Ron, how about you? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, it, there have been track and trace capabilities that have been applied to uh, different sectors like the food industry and for, for years, right? If there's a recall on a, on a thousand pounds of beef, we all know about it. We hear about it in the news within 24 hours. And uh, that sort of speaks to what's happened in some ways in the back end of things with regards uh, with regards to sort of the internet of things and sensors the whole chain of custody of biopharmaceuticals today is being managed tracked and traced uh, all the way down to understanding where pallets are moving within you know a few feet uh, around the globe 
but the regulatory back end of things is really what's also driving this, and it's the IDMP, the identification of medicinal product. Governments know that the pharmaceuticals are being produced in over 150 countries. And the question is, where are all these ingredients coming from? The excipients, the active pharmaceutical ingredients and whatnot. And they need to really understand that, you know, what people are saying is going into these products are in fact just that. And so the identification of medicinal products is a global harmonization sort of effort to really understand what is being offered in a product all the way down to enabling regulatory bodies to compare one product vis-a-vis -vis another in terms of its whole um, offering, if you will, but including, again, going back to the aspect of understanding the safety and efficacy all the way down to like a milligram per milligram level for uh, different compounds, just as an example. Yeah. Well, and I think we're also seeing the whole trend here of uh, you know, needing this information to combat the, the counterfeit drugs that are, that are in the world. I was reading an article this week um, uh, that Hindawi had put out uh, a couple of years ago, and there was an estimate of something like, you know, one in 10 medicinal products uh, in developing countries are, are fake, um, and that roughly a, one, a million people each year lose their lives because of falsified medicines. And, you know, being able to, to, to put this kind of security around so that that kind of thing can't happen, um, I, I think is huge. Um, yeah. But let's, well, let's I think David, let's the block. That, oh, go ahead. To that, point, to that point, David, I'm working the company out in in uh, Ireland right now. That basically, uh, it's a company called Pronav Clinical. That they're actually part of their job has to be to look at the clinical supply chain for phase one. When you're in phase one, phase two trials, they've got to make sure that the companies that are they're dealing with, they've got to go through and qualify all those vendors. They've got to look at the way that they're manufacturing. And if you look at the whole supply chain. They've got to qualify that whole thing and validate that whole thing before they can even think about putting a drug out there for, for a, a patient. So that's when you start to talk about quality and you start to bring in the security aspects of, of um, some of this thing. That's, there are companies out there that that's what they do and that's their goal is to make sure where, before it gets you. And something in Europe that we don't have is the QP, somebody that will actually, they're the ones that are responsible for, for releasing those lots and letting, making sure they can get out to different countries. Um, and, and, those are things that, that I think about when I think about the quality aspect of this. Before we get finished, I, wanted, I do want to jump in and hit on that blockchain slide. I think people hear the term blockchain and a lot of people will say, what is it? And um, so I, I guess uh, Ron or Keith, either one can pick, can pick up on this. Talk to us a little bit about how blockchain works in pharma and how this is going to contribute to the overall quality and security here. Yeah, so there's a company I'm out here in the Bay Area of California. Uh, they've been in the aspect of track and trace for several decades now. They have initially started in the food industry, uh, but they've been in biopharmaceuticals now for the last decade. And they they work in a, sort of a multitude of ways, one, one of which is with regards to the track and trace of product going from one logistical point to another. Uh, they've got uh, sensors that are developed that can go into containers that can understand temperature and humidity, the, the degree to which even the material may be um, uh, disturbed or shaken. And uh, you know, that's just like one small component part. They've then mm -hmm. extended their offering to focus on the idea of IDMP to then look at the all the individual ingredients coming together in a a uh, uh, pharmaceutical product, uh, as an example, and the, to have that sort of ERP-like system, if you will, that helps a manufacturer to understand the, the whole chain of the, procuring those ingredients and then ultimately dispensing them. Uh, but th this is just one of many companies that are out there and it's it's again it's just sort of another factor in the rubik the rubik's cube if you will that we're trying to solve of okay we need to processes and systems and you know blockchain is definitely one of the most critical component parts and it may drive more of the discussions going forward as to platforms of consideration you know 
earlier on, I was talking about, hey, is it an open or closed system? Maybe it's more like, does this fit into the blockchain or not? You know? Anyway. Keith, anything to add? Uh, no, I just think that uh, I'm getting asked for more and more about it. I think that, you know, some of the other systems that we have out there, they're, they don't have it built in. It's not something that, that you see that often in some of the systems, but the more we get down to focusing in on uh, on the patients or focusing in on that track and trace as Ron was talking about, you, you're seeing it incorporated almost daily in, in uh, new technology. So I think it's, it's going to be something we're all going to have to learn a lot more about um, going forward because it's here to stay. Excellent. All right, well, uh, I think we're about to move into some closing thoughts here. Uh, we did get a couple of questions. I, I think we have time for, for one here. So uh, we'll throw it out here, and, and uh, Keith, I'll, I'll go to you first, and then Ron, you can uh, chime in after him. Uh, but the question is, what comes, wh which comes first, the shiny object or a content slash data strategy and implementation? Uh, that is, do you buy the ECM first and then deal with the content or vice versa? Um, let, let's all, there's a couple answers to that. One is it depends on the senior team and how much they like the shiny object. Um, and typically they'll bring the <laughs> shiny object in and then you're stuck with kind of developing a strategy around it. So I see that far too often. A lot of times you'll get um, senior senior management that comes in from someplace and they say, oh, we had to have, we had this system, let's get this one. And they bring it in and all of a sudden the rest of the group has to figure out how to work with it. In my mind, it always comes with the strategy first, laying out that strategy, identifying uh, what it is you're trying to do, and then looking at your requirements and going from requirements forward. If you do this, the, the shiny object, then you build, then basically what you do is you build around that object, and a lot of times that's where things fail. Um, so I would always go with the strategy first um, and driving the, the requirements first. Ron? Yeah, I... I I first off would agree with uh, pretty much everything that Keith said. There's another question that I like to ask companies, and that is, are you ready for this? Because, you know, it's easy to think that the solution resides in a new tool or maybe sort of a new approach like enterprise content management. I think there's the question, though, as to whether the, the business is ready for it. In some ways, systems are often thought of and presented to the business by maybe IT. Sometimes the business functions might be going to the IT group, but it's a it's a dovetailing that has to happen. And then the question is, if it is a dovetailing, whether both sides of the drawer are ready to do it. And, and the, the reality is sometimes the business isn't ready to do it. There may be pressing regulatory filings, as an example, or major studies coming up and maybe the organization's growing by leaps and bounds and they don't have the resources. So that's, if I go back to David's point earlier, it's nice to bring in other parties um, and not to pitch too hard here, but you know, if, if you can't do it within, you need to supplement it. And, and if you feel you need to do it, you know, having consultants may be part of the solution for sure, uh, just to, in, sure that those two folds of the drawer come together and they are they don't collapse if you will because one is bringing in more pressure more resources more capability more desire than the other and you know ron sometimes you may want to bring in those outside parties not to do the new work but to do the old work so that you can do the new work so that you, your people can free up their time to do the new stuff so somebody else will you outsource or, or have somebody else doing the stuff you were doing specifically so you can embrace the change and, and bring in that change manager we talked about earlier. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more there, Keith. I mean, technological revolution is here. And the fact of the matter is people in companies and those that are paid to do the engineering, the design and, and the product development, they are the lifeblood of the companies. And, you know, they're going to be much, the companies will be much better served if they're helping to innovate, to enable them those companies to stay on more of the cutting edge and uh yeah to your point that maybe have reserves come in and manage some of that more um perhaps uh older work more what might be seen as less exciting for some of these people that want that newer exposure too oh and i think that's our alarm that we have run out of time here so i 
I guess with that, I need to turn it over to Marianne and let you close this out. Thank you. So, yeah, we could keep talking about this, I think, for quite a bit of time. Um, but we will continue again on September 30th with our, our, our final webinar in this series. Um, I do want to thank everyone who's taken time out of their day to join us. Um, please keep apprised of upcoming webinars in this series. You can visit dataconversionlaboratory.com slash webinars. Um, this DCL learning series is put together for folks like you um, to continue this conversation around things related to content structure and markup. Um, thank you so much for your time, and we'll see you at the next event. This concludes today's hey, program. Thank you.